So uh, obviously the topic that I have uh, chosen is the science of life, that is evolution. And uh, because this is meant for uh, life science teachers and all aspects of life science uh, need to be covered. You know, So I thought evolution is the only topic which basically covers end-to-end -end all aspects of the life science, whether you talk about cell biology, talk about plant biology, botany, zoology, biochemistry, cell and molecular biology, or, or um, biophysics, and modern you know, uh, topics like cancer biology or synthetic biology, genetic engineering, and, and other topics. So uh, in that context, uh, evolution is central, and I'm sure many of you know uh, the famous uh, statement by Dobzhansky, a very famous evolutionary biologist of um, early 20th century. In 1940s or 1950, early 50s, he made a statement that, in fact, he made a statement in an article he wrote for us, for teachers to teach sciences and particularly life sciences. And he said, nothing makes sense in biology except in the context of evolution. So you cannot teach any aspect of biology without talking about evolution, because evolution is the only one which tells you about why and how and what uh, and which mechanism uh, a biological phenomena exists, operates, and, and then perpetuates. So obviously evolution becomes central to all of these things. But before I go into the specific topic, let me uh, put you in the context of NEP, why the way I, how to teach biology, it sort of should align with the new education policy. We, all of you know, whether it's irrespective of which discipline, whether it's in social science, humanities, or natural sciences, knowledge is global. The, the reason is the knowledge here is something which is more objective. We are not talking about very subjective knowledge, but that knowledge uh, which is produced with the, a series of uh, you know, very different steps of uh, you know, validation, falsification, and going more towards objective reality, that knowledge is obviously global. But all of you know that the problems are local. For example, let's say take the climate change. Climate change is somewhat a, a, a global phenomena, but its impact is very different in different parts of the world. So even such global problem as climate change, its impact is more localized. And if you want to identify a solution to this problem, you need to sort of you know, understand the, the global knowledge and sort of translate into a local solution. So you need to be globally connected and you need, at the same time, you need to be locally rooted. You know, in, in, in modern terminology, not only in education, in variety of different value system, people keep on talking about, you know, be sort of, you know, uh, sort of, you know, uh, adhere to your, the principles of your nation, your society and, and kind of a thing. That's to a mostly cultural aspect. But if you want to look at the way we need to deal with very different societal problems, it could be health problem, it could be you know uh, the problem uh, like a geoclimatic you know problem, water problem. You need to sort of understand the the science behind that problem and try to identify a rational solution, sustainable solution, which is uh, more local. So. Uh, if you look at the, some of the general principles NEP talks about, one is, of course, higher education should be inclusive and equitable. Something what all you teachers need to worry about is uh, how you make sure that what you teach is accessible to a diverse class. Because your classroom is not only one particular you know, group of students belonging to one particular socioeconomic group. They come from diverse socioeconomic group. They will have a diverse learning skills. So you need to make your teaching accessible to everybody. And at the same time, everybody should have an equal access and that equitability is very important. Now, the pedagogy has to be learner centered. It should be very important that every student come out with something learned as a unique personnel. This earlier system was not only in India, even in the Europe, right? Earlier, problem was people were talking about the, the factory mode of education. We need 200 engineers to you know, build you know, railway carriages or steam engines, or we need 200 uh, you know, people to run uh, financial institutions. So there, there is a purpose already defined by the society. 
and you train the people towards that one, irrespective of how much they can learn, how they can learn, what their long-term interest would be, because there is a sort of a streamlined processes. Here now, the modern understanding of education, particularly what NEP wants is every individual has, you know, you have 500 students come in with diverse, you know, backgrounds and interest, and the 500 very mature, still diverse, uh, you know, in terms of their interest and their, their, their career aspirations should come out of the education system, right? So obviously, the kind of skills that is required is more of problem solving and critical thinking skills. They need to be innovative and they need to, you know, be good in teamwork and collaborations and good in communication. These are the modern day skills that are required because because of the internet, because of our ability to connect to people across the city, across the state and nation and the world, it's easier to collaborate and produce more knowledge and identify good solutions and pool resources rather than working in, in silos. So obviously the new skills that are required among our students is how to do teamwork, how to collaborate and to collaborate across different socioeconomic uh, diverse groups, your communication skills be extremely good because what you communicate may be misinterpreted by different people in different contexts, in different geoclimatic conditions. So it's very important that you also learn communication skills. It's, you know, earlier days, okay, I'm a science student, I'm a mathematics student, I'm a biology student. If biology student, I should know how to draw drawings. If it's a mathematics, I should know how to write equations. It doesn't matter what, uh, you know, English grammar I have, you know, proficiency I will have. But but those are the, you know, those kind of thinking will not help these days. Everybody should develop good communication skills. Which language, of course, one can decide, irrespective of which language, communication skills are equally important because it can be misinterpreted. And if it is misinterpreted tomorrow, it can become, become viral so fast. So if I talk to one person, right, and that, that person will, uh, you know, it's not that we are talking, you know, in in face to face. In face to face communication, I can actually, you know, clarify and and provide certain contextual and you know meaning to what I'm communicating. But I'm putting on an email, I'm putting on a Facebook or a Twitter or you know even a WhatsApp, right? There is no opportunity for me to clarify because we don't know who is the target reader of my communication. They may misinterpret. That's how the fake news and become viral, right? So it's extremely important for us to impart good communication skills among our students. And of course, values, you know, it's something which goes without saying. And rationality and scientific temper is the most important aspect. And consciousness about the local environment and the, you know, sustainability. That we should, we are now more conscious because of access to information from across the globe that what I do today, not only it may impact, you know, my neighbors, not in, in immediate neighbors, even at a distant neighborhood, and also tomorrow because of my carbon footprint. So in understanding my carbon footprint is so important if you want to be part of a society in which you don't, you know, be a burden to the society, you, you know, and that, you know, understanding has to come. That's also part of the value system. It's not simply understanding the science of climate change and your carbon footprint. So uh, the most important skills in 21st century, because the information is available all the time, we don't, it's not so important to give you factual information. Today, I'd, you know, no student need to know the details of DNA double helical structure. Don't need to know details of every amino acid structure or the protein structure. What they need to know, the conceptual understanding of the importance of a double helical structure, complementary strands, or you know, the importance of very different types of, uh, you know, uh, bonds or polar, non-polar amino acids kind of this thing. At that conceptual understanding, hopefully they will be able to understand anything they read on internet much easily. So because of the availability of information at the click of a button or on your mobile phone itself, you don't really no need to give so much of information, you know, uh, through textbooks and, you know, asking them to write examination based on some memorized knowledge. It's very important that your pedagogical methods is more about understanding the conceptual, uh, con you know, understand the concepts of life sciences. And this helps them to develop analytical ability to verify the knowledge. As you know, knowledge is uh, particularly uh, 
uh, what comes on, on, in an unverified way through a variety of different social media need to be verified. And particularly during this pandemic, people have realized that you know, 99% of the information about this virus and, this, and the medication and the, the kind of protection that you need to have is actually fake news. Only 1%, which is verified and well thought of through WHO, through you know, AIMS or through uh, very different uh, you know, uh, 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 scientific bodies are the real one, but they are, are sexually less dominant compared to the fake news that is being spread about the pandemic. And world is changing so fast as all that is a problem and challenge to the teachers. Not only world is changing because of the global connectivity and fast changing cultural and socioeconomic factors, because of the climate change, the geoclimatic situation is also fast changing. It's also becoming less and less predictable. In a less predictable world, what is the point in me learning something which may not be useful in a profession that I pick up later? And also, how do we know which job is available 10 years from now? Your students would be ready for a job maybe another six to seven years. How do they know which job is available in six to seven years? So what's the point in learning something which will not cater to their long-term profession or a career, whether it is self-employment or the you know, employed under a certain uh, organization? So self-learning ability, what we always used to talk about life learning, learning skills among the researchers, but now every citizen has to have self-learning ability. Uh, that's the only way to survive in a fast changing world. So as a teacher, uh, you should you know, make the students better equipped for their future. And obviously for that, you need to, you should not simply teach what we learned you know, long ago uh, to the students who are uh, you know, tomorrow's citizens, right? So that's why, you know, in, interestingly, NEP talks so much about what is required in the society for the, what kind of human resources are required for the society through education system. But as you know, the, the important role in the, to fulfill the needs of NEP is by the teachers, right? In fact, many people thought that, you know, oh, the world is changing more to a digital world and there are so many, uh, you know, self-learning resources. Maybe, you know, tomorrow there may not be a need for a teacher. It's actually not true teacher's role is becoming more and more important rather than less important. It's simply that we need to adopt to this changing world. We need to change ourselves with new, uh, learn some new pedagogical skills. Actually, you don't need to learn anything new content. You don't need to learn molecular biology if you have not learned molecular biology. If you are a biodiversity expert, you be a biodiversity expert. That is how you teach biodiversity is what you need to change. It's not that you need to suddenly become a genomics person, right? So, the, 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 the quiet question here is how you adapt to a, a changing situation and align with NEP and develop new teaching skills, right? So this is where a teacher you know, uh, has to really play a very important role. And that obviously that's why the teacher's training is important because all of us, and I'm also a teacher and I belong to a older generation. In fact, many of you teachers in front of the screen and perhaps on the YouTube, are, this, are, the, are the teachers of the a generation after me. In fact, you know, uh, so obviously you maybe are better teachers than me and you should be one be better because you need to be aligned with NEP and to impart new skills to uh, your students. And it can happen only laterally because in large system, you can't close everything and start afresh. It's not like, you know, I demolish this building and, and build a new building because, you know, like our parliament, or uh, you know whatever is happening in Luton's saying that okay you know uh, or this building is old this is maybe dilapidated will not be sufficient it's not good enough let's demolish and build a new one but that's not we can do in a society like ours education system you cannot completely close and say I will start out of fresh again you cannot have such disruptive uh, methods uh, in society uh, dealing with education so what we had to do is to adapt to the changing situation and for which we need lateral support because teachers are already there. There are millions of school and higher education teachers. And in sciences itself, there are lacks of them. And biology itself, there are about four or five lakh uh, undergraduate teachers teaching life sciences in this country. And, and how do you em empower them to uh, align with the NEP and align with the needs of the future for, and then impart those skills? 
obviously we need to provide teachers an opportunity to do this now teachers training in addition to you know providing some level of pedagogical training and so forth and lateral support has to come from education experts education experts not necessarily someone who is part of a ugc someone who is part of some refresher uh, you know what called the faculty uh, uh, development centers or whatever it is a teacher herself can be a a, a trainer uh, an expert for example malika has been part of you know uh, training other teachers in to teach uh, using research based pedagogical methods so it, it, you don't need a you know really a, an expert coming from outside within the system you can have your own experts right and we also need to provide certain leadership skills to teachers here leadership skill is not to carry other teachers with you or students with you like a pipe piper right what you need is i need to lead my life i need to run my profession effectively by innovating methods myself if i provide that kind of a skills to a teacher the teacher will automatically become i need to become a leader for myself i'm not i'm not saying that someone should follow me i'm a leader it's not a political you know statement here i need to become a leader for myself i don't need to follow someone else blindly i need to follow you know, nothing wrong in following good practices but i should not follow good practices simply because there is a a famous person who's more you know prominent in the internet than me doesn't mean that that person is good or that person's methods are applicable to you you need to verify and then decide for yourself what you do that's the you know what leadership is all about and of course digital pedagogy is very important in the modern era because the students also in the rest of their life they're going to learn from using digital resources so they need to know how to use digital resources digital pedagogy is not simply online teaching that's what we are doing because of the pandemic digital pedagogy is actually integrating digital tools digital resources is part of your teaching rather than you continuously speak uh, for more than an hour in the classroom and uh, and students should learn how to use digital resources effectively because as you keep saying that 90% of the digital resources uh, on internet are actually fake uh, nothing very useful. In fact, it can be harmful. So students should learn how to effectively filter the good information out of the noise uh, from digital uh, world. Okay, uh, this is what you're all doing as part of the FTP and uh, I'm happy to be part of this FTP and uh, okay. So, so far I gave you an, a, a pretty longish introduction. But thankfully, it is not as long as Malika introduced me. Uh, it was pretty longer than what I thought. So uh, what I'll do now is maybe in about 30, 40 minutes, I'll try and very quickly, because you're all biology teachers, I don't need to give you, uh, you know, any introduction about very different concepts in biology. I'll just quickly go through, uh, you know, in 30, 40 minutes, uh, one way of teaching biology, irrespective of which uh, subject in biology you're teaching, how you can connect to each other so the students can make sense of a bigger picture about life right so teaching biology is about teaching what is life right so what is life is very complex question we are talking about birth to death and in between life and you know we are talking about natural other life forms and human and and our own interaction within myself and my interaction with the outside world all of these things come you know as part of the living system Right? How do you even explain this living system? So you may teach genetics, you may teach evolution, you may teach biodiversity, you may teach uh, cell and molecular biology, you may teach a sub, a, a, some specific component within life sciences, but you need to connect all of this to a bigger picture. Otherwise students will don't connect. They may study something about proteins, something about DNA, something about uh, you know, blood circulation system, but how do they connect to what is so-called the bigger picture about life itself, right? So that's what uh, you, know, uh, you should teach uh, and that helps them to connect things. So as I told you, you can reduce the content, let them learn on their own, the details, but you always try to connect to a, a, the bigger picture what you're teaching, right? So when we talk about life, you know, as I told you what Mendel tried, you all teach Mendel genetics, you teach in such a way that, you know, she studied, you know, patterns of inheritance, you know, three is to one genetic ratio or sorry, genotype, sorry, phenotypic ratio, 
or nine is to three is to one after a tie hybrid ratio and so forth. But actually the, the, the fundamental question that Mendel asked and the trying to address is actually, can we understand life by looking at how new forms of life, you know, come out, come to birth every time. For example, a human baby comes out of another human uh, parent, right? And if I want to understand what is life, what of all, you know, I, can I find out, is there a pattern by which a human baby is born to human parent or a pea plant is born to another pea plant? And in this process, can I understand what is life? Because finally, if I want to understand life, it's about myself, right? My existence start with my birth. If I understand the pattern by which this inheritance happens, hopefully I'll be able to begin understanding what is life. I don't think he had any imagination that he would be able to answer it, but at least he thought he could, you know, introduce certain tangible and certain kinds of verifiable uh, answers uh, towards this one, right? So that's the beginning of genetics. And genetics is simply is not about three is to one or one is nine is to three is to one ratios. It's actually about trying to understand inheritance of life itself, right? Because from one form, one parent to a, a child uh, in across all organisms, unicellular to multicellular organisms. Then Darwin came. What Darwin was trying to understand the life from a, another version. For example, let's say we have millions and millions of different types of species. Are they all related? We all know that there is something called living system versus non-living system. And within living system, there is so much a diversity, but still there is something common about all of them that they are part of the living system, right? That itself is the common element of all life forms. And if there is further relationship among them, then can we understand what is life? Because I can now work backwards and see what is common amongst all of them. That common among all of them should be the finer details or the, or the, or the essence of life itself, right? So, so he, you know, by the time Darwin proposed his theory of evolution, already classification taxonomy had become very popular and very prominent. People could classify, okay, these kind of insects belong to one group, these insects belong to another group, like Lepidoptera, Coleoptera, Dipterans, or uh, you know, fish versus amphibians versus uh, reptiles and so forth. And within mammals, for example, rodents versus primates, and within primates, like you know, great apes versus you know, uh, uh, you know, old world primates and so forth. And all of these things help Darwin to say that okay, here are the different groups. There are similarities and there are differences, and there are more similarities between certain groups compared to other groups. But there's something if you go on backwards, you can actually see it as a continuum. You know, it's like a you know, if you look at a, a spectrum right and a line so and you number them right don't worry about what basis you number them you number them based on certain similarities so somewhere it's one two three four it may go up to let's say a million so 999 would be closer to thousand or to closer to 998 compared to let's say one or a million it will be farther than from a million but perhaps is closer to one compared to a million right so if you look at these differences, so you think that if I'm comparing one to thousand as a group to one thousand to two thousand as another group, so this group will be closer to one thousand to two thousand compared to say three thousand to four thousand or ten thousand to twenty thousand, right? So if you if you put that kind of a context to evolution, that means at some point everything is a continuum because there is no gap between. 1000 to 1001 or 2000 to 2001. He, he couldn't see any gaps. He saw only continuum. He couldn't see a gap between reptiles and birds. He couldn't see a gap between birds and mammals. He couldn't see a gap because you see that they're different because of certain kind of, but if you look at my very different features, there was a connectivity, even so-called distant groups. This made him say that perhaps everything is, have a common evolutionary thread. And if, and they are like a tree which is branched. And if you work backwards in time, somewhere they should have a common root to all of these things. Because like a tree, right? It starts with the seed. There will be a, you know, a root system and a, and a, and a uh, epical meristem system. And epical meristem system is the one give rise to stem, leaves, branches, and everything. And if you work, if you, if you take the look at the tree and work backwards, you know that all of them must have started from 
one cell, one seed, and which must have given to two cells, one becomes a root cell, one becomes that calmary stem cell. And so he thought that perhaps there is a common origin of our life and everything is you know, connected to each other. And that's how the theory of evolution became a grand theory and now subsequent you know, evidence for this, both the fossil and the modern day uh, evidence you know, confirmed as is a, a theory of evolution is now as confirmed like you know, certain laws of physics, like you know, um, uh, atomic theory or, or in medicine, like germ theory uh, for infectious diseases and so forth. Uh, many of you may teach evolution and one way of teaching evolution because most students get confused with evolution saying that there is a design and how can you get so much of design uh, if everything is you know uh, because of natural forces just think about it you know all of you must have seen this you must be using in your classroom this picture and uh, there are two moths in this you know belong to the same species one is the black another is the you know motley uh, pepper you know, what's called pepper moth. It's basically, you know, salt and pepper kind of a pattern on the wing, right? So the, the salt and pepper kind of one is somewhat camouflaged in the tree, you know, which is sitting on the tree bark here. And the black one is more visible, right? And in a population like this, both are present, let's say, and there's a bird is the prey, for, uh, so the bird preys on these moths. And I'm a predator, I'm a bird. What I would see more prominently is the black one not the camouflage one. So I would eat the black one. So over the time, the black one will have less fitness, so-called your fitness in the evolutionary biology, is simply because I'm more visible to the bird. It's not because of any other reason, not because of you know, the survival of the fittest and all those wrong you know, notion people have using it. There's nothing like I'm more fit or less fit. It's simply because in a context in which I'm sitting, I'm more visible to the predator. So I maybe my population will come down, right? and not the other one so when because of the you know industrial revolution the suit and then it, the color of the tree changed in some parts of europe and and that's where they discovered this concept of evolution and you look at this now the same two species sorry same two members of the species and in another context now the white or the peppered moth is more visible more prominent it gets sprayed by the predator and its population will come down and you call it this has a lower fitness now so as you can see here it's simply a statistical probability of which one is more fit which is less depending on the context and and let's say you know what if predator is colorblind what if predator doesn't have a proper vision right obviously then it will influence your fitness and not because of the in inability of the predator right so you can think of variety of different variants which is influencing the outcome of a specific group and that's what how you know variations are spread within the population of course still it doesn't explain the origin of these variations i'll come to that in a minute i want to give you one more more recent example which is discovered only in the last 10 years or so but it's this evolutionary pattern is happening over the last 50 years this uh, european black cap is a bird which, as you can see because of the black cap right malika how much time do i have uh, you know teachers would you be bored otherwise. Half an hour. Okay. Including the question answer session. So, yes. Uh, another okay. half an hour, Anshika, half an hour, 40 minutes? So we yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Half an hour. Okay, I'll try and uh, go faster. Right? So, European black cat, it sort of migrates. It's a migratory bird, but it migrates a shorter distance, unlike the, something comes from Siberia to east coast of India right to you know uh, uh, andhra coast this one basically migrates from central uh, sort of northern germany uh, to uh, her south typically it might used to migrate to southwest to spain because spain is warmer mediterranean uh, and it can withstand the winter period in spain and then go and and, and they go back to uh, germany during summer for breeding purposes. breeding still happens in germany only to escape the severe winter, they go to a warmer place that they don't breed. It's true for all migratory birds. Their breeding is always in the origin. Like Siberian cranes, they actually breeding happens in Siberia during summer, but during winter, they just come out to be alive. But it so happened that it's not that there is always a variation in the population. This could be simply random. And that variations will make birds to migrate in different directions. If they go further north, it's colder, so they don't come back, they just die. 
if they go lat and horizontal in the same uh, latitude, again, they, uh, you know, die because of the similar kind of winter. Or if they go very west, it's a Atlantic Ocean, they will not be able to come back. It so happened that some of them used to go to north uh, west, and those survived because of the, you know, about 100 years or so, the British Channel, uh, because of the warmer current from the Mediterranean Sea, uh, entered and British, the southern part of England, it became warmer, warmer. Even today, southern England is much warmer than the Victorian time. That's why there are no white Christmas in southern England, the way you see, you talk about in the Victorian novels, right? So that enabled them to survive and they come back. So what happens is, let's say about 100 birds go to Spain and about 50 birds go to Britain. Those 50 birds come back to Germany and these 100 also come back to Germany, but they come back in two different groups in two different time points because of that, simply because of the distance. And this made the, the, the one which come back from Britain to be a separate group and they breed among themselves because they are in the same time zone, right? I'm, I'm, time context, not zone, right? Time zone is something different uh, in the context of Earth. I'm talking about saying that they happen to breed among themselves because they are together uh, when they're flying in and out and they're together in Germany also because the other ones would take longer time to come back. And this is precisely what happened during the last 50 years. There are clearly two subspecies have emerged. One is the origin of black cap and another one is something new, which is morphologically different and the color is also somewhat different. I'll not get into the details right on the screen. And, you know, the evolutionary biology one actually established uh, this concept even before we understood the mechanism of evolution because there was no molecular basis of life was discovered at that time. And I'm talking about 1900, early 20th century. So, but it, Darwinian mode of evolution helped people to thought that, okay, I can use model organisms. If I study Drosophila, I should be able to understand human biology. I don't need to you know, go and cut human body and to understand all aspects of life by looking at human. But if I study one set of organism in great detail, all aspects of life, I should be able to extrapolate those concepts of life to all other organisms. That's the beginning of model organisms, right? So for example, today we know that DNA double helical structure was discovered using DNA isolated from you know, a virus or a bacteria. It's not you know, human DNA, right? But at the same time, very different concepts of cell division, the cellular cytoskeleton, or uh, cancer biology, even much of the cancer biology is using mouse model and the human model, right? So we've understood so much by looking at other organisms is because of our understanding of the evolution that if it is true for a, you know insect, it should be true for an elephant or a human too. And one advantage of doing this is the, all over the world, because you know life is so complex, a living system is so complex. You know, everybody is looking at different things in different places, in different contexts. So you will never be able to address a fundamental question about life if everybody is doing different things. If thousands of scientists all over the world look at the same thing from a different perspective using different scientific tools, hopefully we'll be able to generate so much information about one form of life so that we'll understand the life itself and then it can extrapolate to other forms of life. So that's the beginning of using model again. Like Drosophila is the most popular. There are more than 20,000 groups working on Drosophila in this world, even today. In, in about 20 years ago, it was even more. But things are now with better technology. People can use other model organisms. But Drosophila was the most popular. You know, understanding the cytogenetics to the developmental biology to diseases, you know, Drosophila and population genetics is a, is a you know, most favored model. Because there are three, four such model organisms, E. coli in bacteria, C. elegans as a worm, insect Drosophila, fish, zebra fish, and mammalian mouse. And so many people are working on the same model organisms. We know so much about these systems, which help to understand life in a much better way. For example, one of them is to see that Drosophila had a specific type of chromosomes called uh, giant chromosomes or salivary and in the salivary gland cells, they're also called salivary gland chromosome. You could actually understand the physical basis of this. When Dar sorry, Mendel proposed his you know, laws of genetics, people already knew if there is a pattern, if the ir ir you know, reproducible pattern to uh, inheritance of characters, that must be physical basis for this. If it can't be simply 
you know randomly sort of infused into a living a new form uh, from external sources people used to talk about you know there's some kind of an energy and kind of energy comes into life forms and then suddenly life emerges out of it right it, even today many you know religious or non scientific people believe that maybe something comes into uh, a baby and then the baby is you know becomes living and starts crying it's not that you have to have a reproducible pattern there are 7 billion people on earth all of them have exactly two eyes exactly in the same position across the two across you know on the two sides of the nose or the two ears there must be some physical basis for this it's if it is simply you know a wave form infusing in different ways and there must be some more variations to, you know among the 7 billion people and that physical basis they discovered is the chromosome and then finally the chromosome themselves they first thought the chromosomes are the carrier of genes regulating the uh, you know the characters and then finally they found out that chromosomes themselves are made up of dna and the dna itself is a genetic material and you know dna double helical structure and its two complementary strands and how these complementary strand happens because of the cytosine bond uh, three hydrogen bonds and thymidine adenine two hydrogen bonds and so forth more importantly it also provided an understanding of how variations are generated well well reproducibility of organisms from one parent to its you know, its its progeny was based on the complementarity of the two strands so that this chemical conservation method of dna replication it helps you to make it very reliable right and error proof that's why a human baby is born from a human parent and within you know uh, we all of us 7 billion people have similar kind of features because that hardly any mistake can happen during the dna replication right because of this semi conservative method in any other method you cannot expect that you know writing you know uh, all the letters of shakespeare's collected work if you want to make copies by simply writing right however careful you are you'll make millions and millions of mistakes here billions of these letters are written again and again in trillions of cells right and hardly any variations right otherwise you would not have you know expected a human baby to born to a human parent right in fact you don't see any living baby coming out of a human parent if there are too many mistakes right and at the same time we also see diversity you know the living diversity human diversity within the same family five children are there and five children are not different to each other what's the basis of that diversity right and however rare it is that is still feeds the evolution feel steeds the diversity when without diversity in a changing environment you don't see life perpetuating without diversity life would have become extinct the day it was born right 3.4 billion years ago because environment is changing constantly not only because of the physical forces of earth movement around the sun it's also because of the life itself and because living organisms made you know from anaerobic to aerobic condition in the earth all forms which depend on anaerobic conditions would have become extinct if there was no adaptation uh, with the help of these variations the variations are also possible because of the the hydrogen bonds that are present if you take a ladder let's say you want to climb uh, you know a, a tall uh, so let's say you know, the roof with the help of a 20 step ladder you know if you look at most carpenters or plumbers or electricians who come many times the ladders are broken there will be always one or two steps which are broken sometimes they put a tie or a cloth around it and then some more manage it what they do is they go to third step fourth is broken they go directly to the fifth one so they avoid putting the leg on the on the broken one so that there is no weight on that one but the ladder ladder it functions because the two poles are held together because of the the some of the steps which are you know pretty strong but you can in a tall ladder of 20 one or two you know you know strands are broken it's okay you can still manage as a ladder but if 10 are broken it will fall apart as two different poles and like the dna also if in a in a long chain of dna with thousands and thousands of base pairs one or two are broken not properly strong enough it will still remain as a dna it can go through a dna uh, you know a cell cycle process without any problem and that will add to the new variations so what happens is if there is a missed base pair let's say a cytosine adenine coming and making a two hydrogen bond rather than you know a cytosine and guanine making three hydrogen bonds it can still 
has sufficient energy to remain as part of the DNA double helical structure because there is sufficient number of you know, proper base pair happening. This sort of introduces mistakes in the copying mechanism and these mistakes or variations are the ones which basically uh, is, has generated over 3.4 billion years, all kinds of life forms that we see today. And around 1950s, people started looking at using variety of different technology. And they initially thought that, you know, cell is a unit of life and cell is not autonomous. And only, you know, like, you know, 50 trillion cells in human body, all of them are maybe similar. And it's just that you, these 50 trillion cells have to come together to like a building. A brick itself cannot be called as a building. Brick is just a unit of the building, right? But if you take out and take it as a brick, even if you put, thousand brick in a in a pile it's still a pile of thousand bricks it's not a building right whereas cells are not like that cells are actually not simply unit of life it's a life itself right that understanding came much later around 1950s just around the time when dna double helical structure was discovered by a cinematographer who used a cinema camera in those days there were no small camera like your mobile phone he had to bring in a 70 kilogram camera, put it on a microscope with the help of better adapters and actually imaged, uh, filmed rather, movement of neutrophils in our blood chasing bacteria. As you can see here, uh, you know, it is a 1950 movie. And this made people to think that perhaps we are mistaken that, you know, life is built in a different way. It's actually cell itself is a life. And somehow they are coming together and talking to each other to make a human body versus a mouse body or something. Whereas cell has all the features of life. And then the whole biochemistry and cellular physiology, cell cycle, you know, people started looking at as a cell, as a life itself. It has nucleus, it has all the ribosomes, it has transcription, translation, manage bioenergetics, mitochondria, everything is inside the cell. It's just that some context, they are dependent on each other they do not survive outside because the nutrition, like for example, in human cells, the oxygen comes through the lung. So you cannot live outside without proper supply of oxygen or the nutrition comes from the blood. So you cannot live outside without the, you know, the components of the blood. So what people could do is they can actually start growing human cells in the lab with the help of the nutrition provided the way blood provides. You just put some serum like fetal calf serum and that's good enough for cells to grow in the lab. Now you can study so much about life at the biochemical level, which is the most important. Act. Finally, the real life is all about how the proteins function. The real work causes of living organism is the proteins. DNA is a very you know, innate uh, you know, carrier of information, but the real work is done by proteins. So biochemistry is equally important. And that biochemistry you could study in culture system and very efficiently, much more elegantly, because you can now see cell as, as a complete life itself, rather than simply saying that, you know, it's only one component of life. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I skip, uh, you know, many things. I just want to say, connect variation to, uh, you know, because people always thought that word use mutation, word mistake, but the mistake can happen between the base pair because G and C had to base pair and A and T has to pair. If G and A or C and um, uh, T, uh, you know, make connections, we call it as a mistake. Uh, sorry, C and A and uh, the G and T can make, you know, pyrimidine and pyrimidines. We call it as a mistake, but that mistake is as a chemical mistake. But even in reality, everything is a variation. There is nothing like mistake. Mutation is a very negative term. For example, if I am different from my brother, I'm not saying that I have some mutations, right? It's simply I'm a I have another variations of the DNA, right? That variant, what is actually it means in the context of evolution. Again, you connect biochemistry, evolution, genetics, everything is well connected in this example. So all of you know about hemoglobin. Hemoglobin uh, is a protein which is required for the carrying of oxygen from higher concentration, lower concentration, that is from the lung to the cells. And, uh, and, and through the blood, blood, sorry, through the heart, which basically acts as a pump. But finally, what happens is, is hemoglobin, when it is CO2 rich, when it goes to lung, it releases CO2 and takes oxygen. When it goes to the near the cells through the capillary, cells are CO2 rich and oxygen deficient and oxygen gets exchanged between uh, this one. It's simple, you know, physics.
Now, what happens is, is this hemoglobin, if it is certain kinds of hemoglobin, what you call as normal hemoglobin, and you have a very nice compact organization hemoglobin in the cell, so that makes the RBCs look this kind of a you know, spherical disc-shaped cell. There is another form of hemoglobin, which is called sickle cell hemoglobin, because of one amino acid difference, because of one nucleotide difference in the codon, which all of you know. And that difference makes hemoglobin not compatible to make a nice organization inside the cell. So cell becomes irregular, somewhat sickle cell shaped, at what is shown here. And this hemoglobin is less efficient for oxygen uh, exchange from higher concentration to lower concentration. So people with this kind of hemoglobin if will have some kind of anemic phenotype because anemic phenotype is basically you don't have enough oxygen in your blood or in your cells. Now, interestingly, uh, and if it is some of your heterozygous, again, you can link all genetic terminology here. If it are homozygous, then your sickle cell phenotype, that is in an anemia phenotype, in, in irrespective of where which part of the world you are. And mostly they die in early stages because it's very severe one. Most of the people who are sickle cell anemic are the heterozygous people. They can survive, become mature, they can even reproduce well. But in different contexts, if you are in the, in the mean sea level where oxygen is at highest concentration, sickle cell heterozygotes have really no phenotype, anemic phenotype. As the altitude goes up, where the oxygen levels are lower and lower, they start showing anemic phenotype. If some mountain people with sickle cell hemoglobin uh, 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 variant, they actually are here anemic compared to the people, the same family people with the same heterozygosity. If they go to mean sea level, they're perfectly normal, right? Interestingly, if you also connect this to you know, our pathogen, malarial pathogen, malaria goes and recites its hemo uh, in our red RBCs to eat hemoglobin for their own you know, purpose. Now, this malarial parasite cannot enter sickle cell hemoglobin because there's that hemoglobin, the way it's organized, will not allow malarial parasite to enter the cell. So this basically what happens is so-called mutation or so-called abnormal, what we general terminology call or a disease person, sickle cell heterozygous uh, person is actually resistant to malaria. So if let's say you are in mean sea level, let's say in a coast, there are normal so-called hemoglobin and sickle cell hemoglobin. Sickle cell hemoglobin do not have anemic phenotype because it's mean sea level, there is sufficient oxygen. And there is malaria, let's say, prevalent area. Then so-called normal people are more prone to malaria than the sickle cell person. So there is, if you look at the fitness, we look at who has an advantage in a given look context, it's very relative. In mean sea level, sickle cell hemoglobin person has a, has a better survival opportunity in a malaria prone zone because that person is resistant at the same time there's no anemia phenotype so this is what if you look at the millions and millions of variations which are produced over a long time when very different geoclimatic conditions which is also fast changing today's situation may be different than tomorrow today i may have a variation which may make me less you know ability to reproduce but 10 years 10 generations later the same variation may become prominent because in that context that may become very useful variation so that's how the life has perpetuated and diversified over time. That's what you see as biodiversity today, right? So this is just one example. Uh, okay, I'll skip this. There's too much of the same type of example just to make it just what you see here. I think I'll, uh, diversity is the key. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, you know, population survive in very different ones and genetic diversity without genetic diversity you would not see and that's why every time an organism uh, you know rep reproduces more new variants are generated and typically it's you know if you look at the on an average is one in million uh, base pairs there will be a new variant if i have passed on i have a one daughter and i have three billion base pairs in my haploid genome and i have given three thousand uh, three billion base pairs to my daughter and another three billion 3 billion come from my wife has come. And in a deployed cell, there are 6 billion base pairs. But in that 3 billion base pair that I have given, there is about at least 3,000 I mean, you know, base pair differences between me and my daughter. 3,000 is a pretty large number because only a small percentage of the genome is directly contributed to make the protein. Typically, she's still a human being and, uh, you know, and has many features similar to mine and my wife's. And so that way, there is variations at the same time similarities maintained because of 
this kind of a approach. I just wanted to connect to you know uh, diabetes uh, as a problem. So you know we keep talking about real life problem. How it's a science. Uh, you know our teaching should be to connect to the real life problem. So think of diabetes as a disease. You know in uh, in the 18th century or 19th century. Right. Although diabetes was somewhat known, that it is because of uh, even you know for at least for more than thousand years, we know that diabetes is because of increased sugar levels. But nothing was known about the physiology of the human body so much. Only after the you know blood circulation was discovered and very different aspects of uh, blood biochemistry was known, somewhere in 19th century it was thought that it is because of the increased sugar level in the blood. That means sugar is not metabolized in the blood in the liver. So early 20th century is when it was established that it is insulin is a protein which is required for sugar metabolism. And if insulin is deficient or non-functional, one would develop diabetes as a as a disease. So in those days, whether you are uh, an emperor or, uh, or a servant or a door person or or whatever it is, you will have the same fate. You don't. There's no treatment for diabetes. You would uh, you know suffer exactly the same way. There was no if some spreadsheet you know equity in, in suffering uh, because of diabetes. But later, because of the Darwinian understanding of evolution, people realized that insulin protein, if fun it, whether it is in other mammalians uh, once or in human, it functions exactly the same. There's no difference between human insulin versus another mammalian insulin in terms of its amino acid, some sort of structure, it's some sort of biochemistry. You can do you know, uh, you know, enzymatic assay and say that, you know, insulin functions very similar to the two. So they realized that I can take out insulin from other animals and introduce into the, our, my blood, a human blood, and maybe treat diabetes. So as you can see here, for Darwinian understanding of evolution, that not only that our morphologically be different, our physiologically also, sorry, normally mammalians have some common morphological features, even more than morphological, so there is more similarity among the physiological system like blood circulation and others, and then the sugar metabolism. They started extracting insulin from the slaughterhouses, from the caracas, and then giving uh, insulin treatment to patients. The only problem with this is you get a small amount of insulin by, by so many animals, so insulin became very expensive. So while treatment started, became available because of the scientific breakthrough of evolution, but that treatment was became very expensive until you know nine, late 1970s. Diabetes was considered a rich person's disease. Even if you ask your grandparents, they will tell you all kinds of stories about diabetes and how you know all kinds of novels and jokes and you know uh, essays written about the uh, poor person having diabetes versus rich person diabetes. In fact, you know many cartoons I have read in my time school time also people say two beggars talking to each other and after coming with a report from a doctor saying that oh. I'm rich today. I'm turned out to be a rich person because I have a rich person's disease. You know, that's, you know, diabetes was considered that kind of an approach. But later, with better understanding of molecular biology, people realized that DNA is DNA, whether it is in a bacterial cell or a human cell or an yeast cell. Now you can take DNA for insulin and, and put it in a bacterial cell or a yeast cell. What you make is actually insulin protein. Right, the, the the chemistry, the chemical processes, what happens inside the cell is exactly the same, whether it is outside the cell or in, in different species. It's like you know what I mentioned in the very beginning: an electron is electron, whether it's on Earth or in your body or it's in sun. Right, properties of electron will not change. That's what physicists you know talked about universality of certain concepts. Similarly, chemists have pro proposed the universality of certain kinds of chemical concepts related to life, that the chemical reactions are exactly the same, whether it is inside the, I'm talking about chemical reaction, not biochemical reaction. Like ribosomes are different, as you know, in prokaryotic versus eukaryotes, there are very different biochemical differences. But at the chemistry, at that how hydrogen bond is added or removed, how peptide bonds are added or removed, that chemistry is the same, right? So because of which a DNA can easily get transcribed and translated to insulin protein, outside the host system. That enabled us to produce insulin in a factory mode using simple organism like equally or CL, uh, yeast. Now we make kilogram quantities of insulin. Insulin costs something like for two to three rupees a shot these days. Government hospitals actually give free of cost to everybody. 
So now equity in access to medication to diabetes, which is the most common uh, disease uh, in the world and particularly in India, right? So that's another uh, you know, breakthrough. It's all because of understanding of the real science behind all of these things, right? Not simply because of trial and error method of care. Anyway, uh, I, I think I'll stop here. There is, I thought I'll add something about the origin of life because you know, logical extension of uh, or logical deduction of Darwinian evolution is to think of a single form of life, which basically led to all other forms of life because all forms of life are exactly the same chemistry of life. That is DNA to RNA to protein. And this chemistry, if it is conserved, there must be only one common origin of life and how to look now to on the origin of life itself. One of the most difficult question, people thought that you cannot have an answer to some of these kind of questions is a philosophical question and not the scientific question. Now, as you can see here, uh, starting from understanding the life, like the way Mendel started, and the, I'm, I'm started with Mendel, of course, there are many more people contributed before Mendel too. But from today's world, we can now, we are talking about origin of life. There are fantastic work going on on origin of life. There is so much we know about origin of life. It's all the transition from chemistry to biology, right? Origin of life is about chemistry to biology transition. And that's how we are, you know, people are now, you know, investigating this. So you can connect all of these things in your teaching, irrespective of what you teach, whether you teach biodiversity or evolution, genetics, you know, anatomy or, or physiology or biochemistry. Okay, I'll stop here. Just wanted to take, uh, and, and there is also, you know, uh, uh, Professor Lakotia and, uh, and uh, Ranganath have come out, edited uh, a fantastic, uh, you know, undergraduate, uh, you know, lab manual where Drosophila can be used, which is very less, it's less expensive. It used, can use all aspects. You want to teach biochemistry, you can use Drosophila as a model system. You can teach genetics, obviously, and then all, all, everything that you want to teach in biology, you can use Fly as a model system. And then there's a lot of experimental listed here. You can download and use this in your, whenever post-pandemic you can have physical labs. I'll, I thought I'll talk a little bit about human uh, evolution, uh, human language, uh, human uh, 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 cultural evolution, and how cultural evolution has impacted the biological evolution, how biological evolution in turn has impacted the cultural evolution, all that thing. But basically what I wanted to is, we are just one dot in the continuum of evolutionary process, right? We are not any special. It's simply that we are different from others. And certain differences has enabled it to initiate a cultural evolution. And that cultural evolution has led to the evolution of um, the biological evolution led to the evolution of language, that language led to the cultural evolution. And without talking to each other, we are as good or as bad as a bacteria or, a, or an elephant or a, or a snake in, in the outside in the field. And because of our language, because of our ability to communicate, with our ability to collect knowledge, to accumulate knowledge, we are different than all other animals and we've been able to create a world of our own. Of course, we are also destroying the world of our own, unfortunately. And this should make us feel humble and try to protect the life, not only ours and, the, and all our surroundings. And that's why you need to teach is very, very important. Another thing is the diversity is so important, so essential and so natural. Without you, there is nothing like similarity. Similarities is very difficult to get in biology. Diversity is very common thing to get. Without diversity, there is no life, whether in genetics, whether in physiology, languages, culture. This diversity will basically make us conscious of human rights that I mentioned. If, if all of us are different, right? How can you say who someone is superior, someone is inferior? The only way a society can exist in harmony is if everybody is considered as equal, irrespective of gender, sexual orientation, color, you know, our, our location, irrespective of, you know, what you are, everybody is individual. In fact, there is so much we know about now modern days, genetic differences between two Brahmins in North India can be much more than the genetic differences between a Brahmin and a Dalit in the same place, right? So if you, you, you can always see lots of, you know, interesting, you know, ideas. Sorry, I, I, should, I should have said this. The genetic differences between two Dalit, Dalits, one from South and one from North India, is much more than the genetic differences between a Dalit and a Brahmin in the same location. So all these are all, you know, simply artificial way of 
you know, saying that I'm dominant and someone is not dominant and kind of thing. It's, this mindset has to change and scientific understanding of life will help us to bring in equality and harmony in the society. I'll stop here. Thank you very much.